Um, so I'm curious, just to level set first, um, who in the room spends most of their day thinking about design or doing designing? Okay, who's not a designer? Get out. <laughs> uh, and then who in the room is, uh, is, is currently running their own company, whether it's a small business, tech startup, whatever, whatever you think of as your own company? And then who in the room aspires to run their own company one day? I'm surprised that's not everyone, but all right. Uh -huh. um, so actually, we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to uh, start a company as a design entrepreneur, because that's okay. Bradford's background. So um, actually, just to get things started, just um, walk us through your, you know, your history, where you got started. You start with design within reach, and then yeah, fab, yeah, yeah. and then sure, sure. So it's funny. I, I like I, there's like two things. There's I found myself twice in my life. So the first time was when I found myself as a designer, and the second was when I found myself as an entrepreneur. And um, so. I grew up very poor in Baltimore and was never exposed to arts and design. I went to a, a public school that it was not an option. You, it wasn't something you studied. But I excelled academically and um, was, you know, afforded the luxury of being able to go to a private college and go to school. And, um, you know, I went, I, I got a, a communications degree and I went and worked in PR and radio sales. And at the age of 30, I had this midlife crisis because, you know, from as early as I can remember, I, I lined my walls with posters. I, you know, want, I dressed myself as Don Johnson in pastel blazers. Like, like it was always there, whatever that spark that a designer or someone that, that wants to do something creative in the world. It could be a singer, it could be a movie a filmmaker, it could be an actor, whatever it is. It, I, think, I think it's there from very early on. Um, but I was never given the path to figure it out to be a career. But at 30, I had this opportunity where I said, oh fuck, you hate your life. And so I applied to Parsons and I went to design school. And I got a degree in fashion design. And while there, I realized a few things. One, I fucking hate fashion. <laughs> Sorry if you work in fashion, you're awful people. And um, I hate sewing. <laughs> So, I hate sketching, so it's like, it was awful. I was trapped there for two years. No one spoke English. It was really bad. Um, but um, while, while there, I started working uh, in retail, oddly, at 30, like 2, 33. I, I, I got a part-time job in a store. And um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a real store, it was a you know, furniture showroom. And um, I became the, the number one salesperson working 20 hours a week in the whole company. It just gone public. It was, it's called Design Within Reach. Herman Miller owns it now. And that's where I fell in love with furniture and, um, and uh, industrial design and everything else that's not fashion in the design world. Which kind of led me to, you know, I started writing for, for, for lots of magazines. I wrote for you know, Huffington Post, I wrote for Dwell Magazine. And, um, and while I was working in the design world, I started opening stores basically um, for a couple different retailers. And I got a call from someone that said, hey, you want to start a company with me? And it was an old friend, 10 years old. Um, and he uh, said, I want to start this um, gay website, social network. And I'm like, why do you want me to help you? He's like, you're the gayest person I know. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay, yeah, I was, I was born for this job. And so, you know, Jay, <laughs> and look at the socks. Um, but uh, <laughs> so, I, so we start this company. I don't know anything about technology. I don't know anything about this world. I don't know anything about you venture capitalist. And I'm just like, oh, fuck, I'm thrown into it. And we raised $3 million. We build this product. And, you know, I did most of the graphic design work. You know, you learn Photoshop and, and fashion design. I think, I think a lot of design disciplines, trim, if, you, if you're good at one, you can, you, can, you can apply that talent to multiple different types. And so, you know, I've decorated homes. I've, I've done a lot of graphic design work. I've done a lot of things. Um, I can make a course that, um, a lot of you can't, I bet. Um, but um, no one used this product. We raised $3 million and no one used it. We spent $2 million and then I was like, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a sinking ship. I was Celine Dion at the front of that boat and um, no one got that because I'm so old. Um, and, and so I got to this point where we said, um, I said, I'm leaving Jason. And that's when Jason said, why don't we take and make a company based on your point of view in this world? And that's where fab.com was born. 
um, and I don't know if you want to lead the conversation or I can keep talking, um, but that, that's, that's kind of how I got to be an entrepreneur. It was by chance, and it happened very much later in my life. It's great. And I, um, I had a, actually a personal question. I applied for a job at Fab five, <laughs> five years ago, and uh, you didn't hire me. We had a very strict cultural fit policy. <laughs> 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 I was wondering how that would go. Um, right. So, bring, bring you know what? <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, fair um, enough. So let, let's take it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you found a bazaar. Yeah, um, yeah. Tell us. We have actually yeah. a little oh, bit sorry. of bazaar. Oh yeah. Back 20, I'm a retailer. So, I'll schlock anything. <laughs> um, much like Ben, I'm a salesperson. I'm going to get up here and sell the world to you. Uh, buy something, please. I'm an early stage startup, and every dollar counts. Um, so, but, so what yeah. is bizarre? Bizarre is really a continuation of like, like so I had this aha moment. So, so when we found a fab. So fab was the first six months. So we built fab in three months. We had the idea, drunk at dinner, much like I'm drunk now, and three months later, I had five beers. That Spanish guy, you're Spanish, right? With the tattoos, where did you go? <laughs> he said, that's your fifth. I was like, oh, there, are you Spanish? Oh, the Italian guy said, that's your, did you, you said, that's your fifth beer. I was like, thanks for, how many are you on? How many are you on? Uh, yeah, same one. Yeah, okay, go. <laughs> Wait, well, where was I? You were telling us what, you, you were telling us what bizarre is. Oh, okay. So, no, because the fab story is important. So, so, so at fab, like, at first it was like, oh, we have a million dollars in the bank. You're going to start a company. It's all about you. And it was very much a selfish thing. And, um, you know, I designed the logo. I designed the UX for the first fab iteration. I chose every single product. I, taught, I, hired every, I, I interviewed the first 300 employees. I wrote every piece of copy. Um, and it really came from a place in my heart. But when we found it, it was very much like, I want to present myself to the world, kind of like Taylor Swift. <laughs> What I realized, though, very quickly into the fab experience was that it wasn't about me. And it was this really humbling thing. And it was like, it was about all these people who had like given up a day job to focus on being, doing weird shit. Like, I'm going to make clocks. Who says that? There are people who, who, who say, I'm not going to work in a factory and I'm not going to work for my dad's company. And I'm going to make clocks. And I realized that, like, I started getting these gifts. Uh, gifts. Gifts, not gifts. <laughs> gifts with a T. Uh, sorry, I, I have a, what is it called when gay people talk like that? That's list. list. Thank you. Yeah, I have a list. Sorry. Um, and I started, getting all, I started getting all these stories. Oh, I got out of credit card debt because we sold $40,000 worth of products. I quit my day job as a graphic designer, and now I'm a jewelry designer. I hired my first assistant. And it was like, it was this aha moment where I'm like, holy shit. It's about them, not about me as a tastemaker. And Fab, you know, it was a great experience. It changed my, li it changed my life. I'm standing here today because of it, sitting here today because of it. Um, but what we're doing at Bazaar, the mission is, is one of taste and aesthetics, definitely. Like, there's a point of view in the world that I have, and not many people have it, and I want to show it off. But really, it's about empowering these people who have given up their, uh, the, the safety of working in a, a day job to pursue their passion, whether they make jewelry, whether they make like feather dream catchers, whether they make um, you know graphic prints. If any of you graphic designers want to do it, like you know, present your turn your work into posters or prints with us, it's really easy. Our art buyer is here today. Talk to her, Cat. Um, you know, we'll make you a star overnight. Um, but anyway, it's about them now, and that's like that's what fa uh, the bizarre. Excuse me, that's what bizarre is. It's it it it, it it's very much. We, we have built a company and a business that is there to, to empower and give a dignified platform that's free of copies and fakes um, for uh, graphic, industrial, furniture, lighting, textile, and jewelry designers. That's great. Awesome. And then uh, let's actually stay on the people yep. thing for yep. a second. So as a design founder, you come up with an idea, whether it's beer fueled or not. Yep. Um, what's the first thing that you do? Like, so you have an idea, you want to bring it to life. 
who do you go hire? What, what, you know, what, how do you get started? So, like, you know, I have this thing, it's called one thing. So, do one thing and do it better than anybody else. Everything else, let other people do. And this is a problem. I wrote this essay on Medium that like, like 400,000 people read and most people hated it, but it was like, it was called You're a Designer, Not the CEO. And it was basically this rant about designers and how they think they fucking know everything and I'm one of them and they get on my fucking nerves. And so it was like, so it's like, know what you're good at, but also know what you're not good at. And oftentimes designers are not great at communicating. They're great at empathizing and they're great at understanding and they're great at creating but they're not always great at communicating, and communicating requires listening. So the first thing I wanna do when I have an idea is I get people to listen, and then I hear what they say, and I actually listen. It's not like how am I gonna get these pawns to get in order and march to my command and do what I want to say, but my philosophy is I have this idea and how are the people that work with me gonna better it? And so it's, it comes from a place of collaboration. So it's almost like I, I almost, I am a designer by trade, and I think I think like one sometimes, but a, a much more a, a connector. Like for me, it's about the experience with people and talking to people and doing things together. So like, like I know I'm really bad at a lot of things and I know what I'm really good at. And I pass off everything I'm bad, off, bad at to everyone around me and hire the people that are going to be the best ones to do it. I'm sorry, you must not have been one of those people when you applied. Um. <laughs> I never should have asked. Um, so, so actually, can you code? Uh, let's, let's jump Absolutely that. not. Okay. No. <laughs> so. I can barely use Excel. <laughs> you know, like Julie said something about the dial-up. I'm like, well, when I went to college, we didn't have computers. Like, I, the Botox works. But I'm like, like, <laughs> The crazy thing about this world is, you know, I work in this technology world and I'm so like not the right person to be here. <laughs> uh, well, so where do you find these people? I mean, how did you, do you have a technical co-founder? Do you have developers that you've hired? So, so I think there's, a, there's, there's two things, there's two questions. There's one about the technical co-founder and I'll answer that because it's a big taboo here in this industry. But one is mostly about where do you find people? And this is my big advice for anybody. From the from moment I was born to now, I have always made it a priority to be present with people with me. That's whether they're my Uber driver, they're the waiter, they're a billionaire, they're fucking Pharrell Williams, who I have had dinner with. He, told, he said I was the new Pee Wee Herman. He said, I'm the new, he said, you're the new motherfucking Pee Wee Herman. I was like, yes I am. And so, but I have, like, you have not, to, you have to, you have to be thing. present with people. And if you're, that means listening, empathizing, making a real connection, not using people as a stepping stone. If you do that, 10, 15 years into your career, you have an army of people on your side. And you have an army of people who would jump to work with you. And I've been blessed with that, that ability. And so that's why it's like one of the biggest things I try to teach the people who work with me are, is um, always be interviewing, always be meeting people, go to events like this, even if you have no agenda to do it, because you never know. Jason Goldberg and I met at the Roxy shirtless on ecstasy in 1998. <laughs> and we founded a company together that changed my life 12 years later. So like, you have to like, like be open, don't do drugs. <laughs> I was very young, but be open to experiencing people. And I think that is, that is how you build a network that eventually allows you to meet other people that can do things, great things with you. CTO, I don't have a technical co-founder. It's a big, scary thing to talk to VCs about that. I had firms tell me, ones that emailed me, asked me to meet with them. I didn't say, give me your money, they came to me. At, say, who's your technical co-founder? I said, I don't have one. They're like, oh, well, you don't invest in techno companies without technical co-founders. I said, I'm not asking for your money. Because you're not investing in, th in this because of the technology. If I opened up a store on the street, you wouldn't say, who's the architect? You'd say, what are you fucking selling? 
I love it. And so, so it's so about the curation. It's about the products. It's, so but did but now I realize how important it is now that we've actually done it. <laughs> but, but, so how did you get it built if you don't have a technical Well, company? one is I've done it before. So I did it before. At, at Fab, we were blessed with, the, blessed with having a 100-person team in India who were, who were our proper employees. It wasn't an outsourced situation. So I did understand at least kind of the back and forth of working with the development team and engineers and at least understanding their like volatility and how crazy they are and how mean they can be. Um, but <laughs> here's an engineer in the room. Oh good, it's all designers. Um, and designers are actually worse. Um, but um, <laughs> But here, you know what I did? I said, I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew exactly what I wanted to look like. I'm not stupid. I studied the competition. I studied the, the best shopping experiences online. I studied the best apps, the best social experiences. I built a company already where I really loved at least the first iteration of our product. And so I had this like knowledge of exactly what I wanted. I interviewed people just much like I, inter I interviewed teams. And then here's the crazy thing. We were about to sign a, 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 a use an outsourced firm. And then just I happened to just, I happened to email this one team in Baltimore, where I'm from, who had built three websites that I loved. And I said, this was, and three days later, I, I, I brought them on board. And they, they, we launched, we launched Bizarre.com in three months. Um, That's incredible. Yeah. And then, um, actually one, as far as the building phase goes, I think we hear a lot these days about minimal, minimum viable product. Yep. And I, my guess is, as someone who's got a strong design opinion, um, you're not interested in minimum viable. No, I actually am, because here's the thing. I'm a modernist. And so it, it, as much as like, like I'm really tacky at some things, and if you look at my apartment, you can't even put a drink down on our coffee tables. I have four coffee tables, <laughs> but you can't even put a drink down because it has like typewriters and feathers and all this crazy shit on it. But like. At my, in my heart and soul, I'm a minimalist. I believe in stripping things down. And less is more. You know, Ava Zeisel said, the best design gets out of the way. So an MVP actually allows you to strip things down and to produce something that is visually beautiful and stunning and simple. And then, um, so it actually is not, not, not to, for someone who thinks, I think, modern, like with a modern aesthetic, graphic, simple, clean, um, it actually is pretty easy to get to an MVP where I as a CEO and our developers and our product guy and our designers are all like, we're all pretty much in sync. That's great. Yeah. And then um, any specific things you threw out as part of that process that hurt a little bit? <sighs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, we, we launched 90 days ago to the public. Um, and uh, we launched with um, what I know best, which is, I say publicly, we call them pop-up shops, but really they're flash sales, it's just not a fashionable thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like product that's here and then goes away in several days. It's just the easiest thing. I know all the brands that I work with are used to it. It's easy, it's great exposure. I knew exactly how to build it. The big dream though for Bazaar is to create a marketplace that is free of copies, free of intellectual property violations, that has a modern aesthetic, that has tens if not hundreds of thousands of primary storefronts for graphic industrial furniture, lighting, textile, and, and jewelry designers. We didn't launch with that because that's a really hard thing to build. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about launch. Yep. So how um, how did you get your first customer? How did you get your first 10 customers? How did you get your first 100 customers? So, or we, do you so, have 100 customers? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> thank God. Uh, so we have members and customers. So we, you know, again, it's a pop-up shop, it's a flash. Um, we, we, we make people give us their email address to get to see the merchandise. Eventually you abandon that, but it's, it, it is a self, we, we have to f fill the, the list. So really what we did was, you know, we went out to the press and said, hey, I'm starting a company. And luckily, the press wrote about it. And um, we had a bunch of people sign up and give us their email address with just the splash page that had some pretty things on it. And, um, and we had a lot of people sign up. I personally emailed, the great thing about Gmail is it knows, it collects every single person I've ever emailed. I've emailed 18,000 different people. I fucking spam them all. <laughs> 
I got like 1,400 people to join just from me emailing them. Um, and, um, and so it was all word of mouth at first. It was either the press being kind, my own social, social, social network, our, our seed round investors' social networks, and our early employees' social networks. Uh, we launched March 17th. We had 17,000 people on our email list. Wow. It's since more than, it's, it's, it's five times that now, um, three months later. Um, but it was first word of mouth. We didn't spend a dime on acquisition or, or marketing for the first 45 days of the business. So now we're 45 days into actually spending money. We're spending very calculated small amounts of money and we're doing it entirely on Facebook with the lookalike because we were lucky enough to have um, a large audience of people that had given us their emails so we could match, match other people like them. That's great. Uh, and then I guess one last area before we sort of open it up to the crowd, but um, you touched on fundraising a little bit. Yep. Um, I think that's a world that a lot of people, you know, want to learn about. Yep. You know, any observations you've, you've done at a fab, you've done at a bazaar, yep. things that you've learned that have been helpful for you? Yeah, I have to say, it's like, it was a really cool, it, it's been a, it's an intimidating experience. It's a cool, I mean, I've been like in meetings with the Mo Hong Kong Monetary Authority. <laughs> like, like, like crazy, like, it's crazy. Like, we, like Andrews and Horowitz, I think wrote a $70 million check for fab. So it's like, but the worst thing about raising money is even if you've done it a hundred times, which I have, like your deepest insecurities come out through the process. Because for every, for every 40 people that are going to say no, one's going to say yes. And it's like you kind of have to hear that this dream you have, a lot of people think it's not a good dream. And it's a really hard process to go through I think emotionally, especially for someone who's who is an emotional thinker, like I am, like uh, I'm, 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 much, I'm much more lead with instinct and heart than I do with intellect. Um, it, it can be really baffling and challenging and hard. But with that said, it's really easy if you actually make real relationships with the people in the venture community, because again, they're just people too, and you know, people. I could be the poster boy of like the horrors of raising too much money. But I emerged from it as someone that, you know, a, a, a community of people who really have nothing in common with me. Like, like, like I don't wear khakis, I don't, like, you know, I don't, it, it, it's like, it's almost like I'm an alien walking into these meetings, especially on the, on the east, on the west coast. Here it's a little better. And, and it's, it's, but when you actually form real relationships, you can always pick up the phone and call those people. And you know, it just takes, like, it just takes one person to convince you have a great idea. And the great thing about the VC world is the rest of people get in line and follow it. If someone's, if someone's willing to take a chance on you, smart, some other smart people that trust that person's instinct will as well. That's great. And um, so questions from the crowd. Let's, let's actually turn to that. Anybody? No. Oh. Look at that, nothing. No one has a um, question. <laughs> I, did, I did have one more. What's, okay, um, sorry. What's a, a recurring question you saw in the fundraising context? Because you've done now two e-commerce, yep. you know, marketplace businesses. What's something you've seen a lot or heard a lot? Yeah, I mean, the, the two pieces of feedback I get a lot are, um, do you have a technical co-founder? <laughs> <laughs> And that's a fun, that's a fun conversation. Um, and the other is, um, uh, have you built anything? So I think they, 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 that a lot of people who who fund um, startups um, want to see something built, and it can be crude. It can be um, you, know, um, you know strung together with masking tape and string, but um, you have to have built something. And that means you have to have, before you could even pay someone, convinced other people to do some stuff with you. And that's hard work because especially with the, developing, the development part, those people are in so in demand and cost so much money that it's a really challenging place to be to find someone that can bring a dream that you have to, to reality. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Cool. Um, well, let's, oh, go ahead. I have no idea, but my spirit animal is parakeet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an ENTJ. I don't know what that means. I think you're an ENFP. I'm definitely an E. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know. Like I think with my heart, and I just I follow my gut. 
Um, the, first, the first reaction I've ever had to anything in my life, whether I actually acted on it or didn't, was always the right thing. And, um, and so I don't know, I don't know why I'm saying that. It's, <laughs> hi, yeah, you in the back with the hat. I have two questions. Yeah. What's your son? Son? Son. Oh, Gemini. My birthday was last week. Yeah, Ge give it up to Gemini. Crazy two-faced bitches. <laughs> I'm 39 years old, can you believe that? <laughs> Go ahead, and what's the second question? Do you disassociate yourself with the value community, uh, user-based models? Well, I have no connection to them. I can't get them. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't steal the lists when I walked out the door. I have not disassociated myself with the fab community that was our former employees. I mean, we had over 700 former employees, of which four work with me now. And I probably see, I mean, we, we were right on Broadway on, on top of um, Dina DeLuca. And I swear to God, there's a former fab employee just standing on that corner every, like, every day texting me, I can see you. <laughs> And so, you know, I, whenever I travel the world, it's always like a meetup. It's kind of like we have this like weird society of people that went through that experience together. And um, we all relate to one another, so it's kind of cool. Now the designers, though, definitely part of that community. And, and you know, and that, and that, that's what's fueling what I'm currently doing. Yes, the, the good looking ginger in the back. <laughs> I'm drunk, sorry. <laughs> Oh, you're so, you're, this is a, I didn't ask you to do this, but this is so good. Click it, click it. <laughs> keep going, keep. So this is my aesthetic, which is crazy. <laughs> and so, so this is a great, no, this is a great story. It's a great story. So like when we designed Fab, I was in India. I was driving from the Fab logo. I was in India. We were driving from Pune, where our development team was, to Mumbai to fly home. And like I drew the heart, and then I was like, oh my god, what are the colors? And I immediately thought black, white, and red, because that's like what I always wear if I go to like a black tie event. The history of Fab, I always felt trapped, though, with these color palettes, because everything we sold was every other color. And like black, white, and red doesn't work with everything. And I'm, I'm more a decorator than a designer, an art director than a designer and color is like the thing that I feel the most and so we created this company Bazaar and I'm actually writing an op-ed right now about color and branding because when you think about like Google you think of like the primary colors you think about Coca-Cola you think red target ready you, you immediately associate color with brand and so I was like struck I was like holy shit this is the most important decision we're gonna make what is Bazaar's color palette going to be and if you're the guy who's known for being every fucking color in the world, you can't choose a color. It's impossible. And so I emailed Kenny Lair. And Kenny Lair is what our lead, in, our lead investor. He, is he an investor in Splash? Also an investor in Splash. Yeah, his son. Yeah, his son. His son. Same, 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 same lineage. And, um, and Kenny Lair in his office, the reason why Kenny Lair led our seed round was because I walked into his office, he had lime green walls, and he had like 12 Warhols on the wall, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm home. <laughs> and, like, and so he, has this, he had this fish aquarium that's shaped like the MTV logo. It's clear, it's like um, a plexi, and there's, a lot, there's live fish swimming in it. And I emailed Kenny like a PDF that has 100 color options, and I'm like, how the hell can I pick a color for a brand that's about color? He goes, don't pick a color. MTV never picked a color. Every commercial, every 30 seconds, every 30 minutes had a different color. And I was like, so I started looking at MTV logos and I got obsessed, they're cheetah print. They have, they have like uh, flamingos in them. They have like, some are black and white. So, and so I was like, so we don't have a color palette. So our website changes color every single day. Our emails different color every single day. All the accent colors on the site change different. And all, all my... My business cards are all a different color. <laughs> and so that's, so we're basically the rainbow. <laughs> Awesome. And then uh, I guess just one last question for me. Yes. Um, I'm sure a lot of uh, entrepreneurs ask you for advice. Yes. Um, what's the piece of advice you find yourself giving time and time again? So the number one piece of advice is don't ask for advice. <laughs> no, seriously. I don't look at competition. I don't care because I'm in a vacuum. I just think about what we're doing. And so, but if I had any piece of advice, 
I would say there's some bad advice out there to not listen to. And that bad advice would be, um, the one that really drives me crazy in the startup community is hire fast and fire fast. And I think that's cruel. And I actually think that that's showing failure in your part as the hiring leader. And that you, oftentimes when people leave jobs with 401ks, supporting families, just do the startup thing because they're following this dream they had and, and, and they're giving up something that's much more um, solid and concrete. And I really despise the, this notion that does exist in the startup community of just disposing of people because it's so critical. It's, this is the most critical time in any bad person in the, like, so, so that is my piece of advice. It's on you. And does that mean the vetting process has to be better and more thorough? Or does that mean you actually try to get people to change? You give them the chance, but I really don't like that. So my piece of advice is don't follow that advice. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you very much, thank Bradford. You. Thank you.